Hi, uh, it's Evan Leibovich again. I'm here with Sam Lanfranco to pick up from where we left off previously, uh, talking about uh, infrastructures for the internet, how people are going to be aware of their uh, privacy, how people are going to make sure that the internet works for them as opposed to against them. And uh, now I want to turn the conversation a little bit to some of the structures that have been put in place so far to try and deal with internet regulation, internet governance. Uh, we've both been a part of ICANN, which is the organization that regulates, uh, it doesn't like to be called a regulator, it, it manages uh, internet names and numbers. Uh, it, along with some other organizations, has become a champion of what's called the multi-stakeholder model that tries to bring many different groups to the table to talk. Uh, there's been a perception of a conflict now between uh, the multi-stakeholder model and what was seen at ITU last year, which was a bunch of governments getting together and saying, we want to agree on something multilateral. And so this was seen as a threat to the models that have been used. So could you talk a little bit about how you've seen this going down and uh, and what's going to happen? There's a big conference in Brazil going on this year. Uh, the ITU is meeting again later in the year to try and you know rehash some of the things that they didn't fix in Dubai. Okay. What do you think of what's going on? Um, just a bit of a historic perspective on this. Had the nation states understood what the internet was going to become, there would have been very, very early jockeying to take control of it in some kind of multilateral framework where states agreed on some, some document and then used that document to try and regulate it and govern it internally. Uh, fortunately, uh, they didn't understand that and that the champions initially said that it should be a, a kind of free and open space for the flow of information and communications and dialogue. The corporate sector very quickly figured out that they could use it for command and control across the globe for their financial and, and economic and production interests and, and they've done that quite successfully and the retailers have figured that out and so forth. But this you have to think of the, the, the whole internet ecosystem. It's got all these players in it. Some are just me trying to find a movie. Some are Google or Amazon trying to sell me something. Uh, and the big players, the, they're called the I-stars within this group. The big fish in that are groups like ICANN, uh, the International Tele Telecommunications Union, uh, the, the Internet Engineering Task Force, people who are more on the technical side and so forth. So there are these big fish, some worrying about the technology of this Internet ecosystem, others worrying about who gets to decide who does, does what, what the rules and regulations are. Uh, where, uh, ICANN would have never been what it is now had some of these vested interests understood better to begin with. Uh, ITU with the growth of, of uh, digital communications lost part of its mandate, which was to regulate long distance phone calls. So it's looking to reposition itself too. It's got a self-interest as well as representing the governments. And then the governments have got their self-interest. So there's a, there's a struggle taking place here and it's got two parts to it. One is jockeying for position, positions of power and authority. And the other is what to do with those positions of power and authority. Civil society is worried about a kind of oligopoly taking place with some big players dominating things. Some countries are worried about how civil society will survive in that country uh, if, if the government can do things that are now are sanctioned by, by the global economy or the global polity. Um, it's a very difficult time and one organization, ICANN, started with this multi-stakeholder model. Okay, it's a, an under-articulated multi-stakeholder model uh, and it has lots of internal weaknesses to it. Uh, but they're the kind of internal weaknesses that get corrected by not necessarily going to another model, but figuring out what the weaknesses are and strengthening it. Um, everybody's a stakeholder in the internet. So you can't have everybody, you can't have six billion people at an ICANN meeting. Right. You know, so who is actually there? Who do they represent and who are they accountable to? These are some issues that haven't really been worked through. If I go representing the Canadian Society for International Health, which is what I do on, on the meeting, on, the, uh, uh, on, on some ICANN uh, committees or organiz organizations within ICANN, what are my obligations to the Canadian Society for International Health? 
what are their, what's their mandate? What should they tell me? Well, in some cases, there's no link at all. Somebody's nominally representing something, but they're actually kind of representing themselves. Okay, so there's a whole lot of issues around the multi-stakeholder model. And one of the ways that I view it is that these big fish see themselves kind of, they're almost like walled cities located around the internet. And they've got a whole bunch of internal issues they're dealing with and problems. But when they look out at the stakeholders, they have an ITU-centric view. They have an ICANN-centric view. The, 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 you know, the ISOC uh, is a different character, so they don't quite have an ISOC-centric view. Uh, but there are all these stakeholders outside those walled cities. What are the stakeholder-centric views? What are the health app users? centric views? What are the education, the student centric views? What are the uh, uh, urban planning, neighborhood urban planning issues centric views? All these things. The, uh, earlier we talked about the, the media conglomerates trying to chew up uh, control over a lot of the bandwidth. Uh, well, what are the customer centric views of all of that? So the multi-stakeholder model has a lot of promise in it. Uh, in the way it worked out in most democracies is that it ended, up, it, it ended up producing a representative system of democracy where whoever is speaking for a constituency uh, has obligations to that constituency and they can be booted out or not booted out. So it's, a, it's one of those struggles that will sit on the front burner for a long time with various players jockeying for position. Uh, the important thing is, is not what happens with the players up here, but what happens on the ground. To go back to my example of the uh, silent revolution in Quebec, since we're in Canada, uh, it's those people on the ground who were thinking about what the church was doing, not in church of, terms of its religious doctrine, but what it was doing as a political entity in Quebec. And in, in a decade, they simply walked away. They were loyal, loyal, they were obedient, they walked away. Well, similar kinds of things are going to happen here, and the, the parishioners at this point are the ordinary citizens who have access to the internet and can communicate, collaborate, coordinate. They can put up blogs, they can put up nonsense, and it gets knocked down or people believe it. But it's that ferment at the enabling level uh, and promoting engagement and education at that level that's going to determine what happens up at the top, what, what the ultimate fate of ITU is, what the ultimate fate of, uh, of uh, ICANN is. Because you can, they can make decisions up here, but if the people on the ground who have some flexibility now, because they have access to the, to the communications for coordination and collaboration, you know, that's not taken away from them. And even when you try, when China says, let's put a, put a wall around the internet in China, the Chinese are aware that there are 100,000 domestic bloggers and that the wall has holes. And China, uh, this is a good example of, of stakeholder relationship here, China has gotten mad at the New York Times and Bloomberg business news because they published all this all these documents about how rich the Chinese leadership is now and their families. And they were going to try and ban them from access to China. But the New York Times and Bloomberg responded by saying, everything we published is publicly available in China. We just pulled it together. We didn't have whistleblowers. We didn't have insiders. And the message going back to the Chinese leadership is, is very important there. They can't simply say, not true, because it is true. But this, that this mass that's going on below them, which used to be easy to control, it's not. So this multi-stakeholder group that's outside the walls of ICANN or ITU or, or whatever, that's where the changes are going to come from. That's where the pressure is going to come. And trying to guess where it's going to go in the short run is extremely hard because these things can go well or badly in terms of the principles of the kind of society we like to live in on the globe. But in the long run, the money is, is, is on the people on the ground uh, unless you end up with extremely vicious governments. What can ICANN do to shore up its own model to try and 
demonstrate to the world today that it has more uh, that it has the legitimacy to do what it does. Okay. Well, this is this is a real challenge for ICANN, and I don't think ICANN understands the challenge. It doesn't understand how flawed its multi-stakeholder model is. It thinks if it's got 10 or 15 or 20 people in the room and they're affiliated with 5 or 10 or 15 organizations, that's somehow a multi-stakeholder voice. No. Frequently they're not accountable to their organization. Frequently they have no obligation to even go back and educate their organization. Uh, they may bring really good ideas to the table. They may be really well-meaning. They may bring constructive ideas to the table. But that doesn't make ICANN a viable multi-stakeholder organization. And as the stakes go up, there are going to be those who believe that ICANN is where the decision making is made are going to, are going to swamp ICANN. You know, you can't, suppose 100,000 people want to show up at ICANN 55. There's no way you can do that. So they have to think of a new model of that. The other is that ICANN, ICANN has this ICANN-centric view, and that's that we'll teach you about internet governments through the eyes of ICANN. We'll refer to those principles, but we'll get you involved in ICANN internal dynamics, which can get very, very narrow. They can be over who represents who on what committee and so forth. But the other one, the other one is today, if ICANN has something burning in the oven that they have to deal with, it's how to handle the contentious global top-level domain names. They'll talk about how do we keep the pedophiles out of dot kids and how do we keep the kids out of dot porn. Uh, but the real issues are what do those dot coms mean? You know, as I said, said that in our previous discussions, dot halal and dot uh, kosher are being objected to by large groups within those two communities and not on religious grounds. They're, they're, they're with respect to how the process is handled. Dot health, same issue. So if, if, if ICANN simply says, as they have with dot health, the only thing ICANN is prepared to look at with respect to dot health is whether or not the word itself is offensive, which is what they did in December, mm -hmm. and then rule, not surprisingly, no, it's not offensive, issue closed, they're, they are, they're just sitting on a ticking time bomb because the global health community is not going to walk away from that. What about the concept in general of private ownership of a dictionary word. One of the things that became contentious in ICANN was dot .book. Yeah. Amazon says that if it is the winning entry for dot .book, it's going to close it off and make it totally for internal use. Mm -hmm. Now, we've already gone through a regime that you can have book.com, and that's owned by one particular bookseller. Yeah. This just takes it up a notch to the top level. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this becoming problematic? The ticking time bomb that you're that you're talking about. Yeah, it's part of it. It, it is. It's, it's becoming. It's very problematic for for a number of reasons. Uh, it would be like me or like you discovering that I own the letter A. You can do whatever you want, but you can't use the letter A unless I agree, or I own the number seven. You can't use it. I have to use it. Okay, so. So there's some issues around that. How to resolve them is not easy. Uh, people who like Kinder Eggs, dot Kinder is being taken over by the company that produces Kinder Eggs. Uh, yeah. Dot ABC is being sought by Disney because right. Disney owns ABC. So if I go to them and say I'd like to be Al Jazeera dot ABC or CBC dot ABC right. or Sam Lanfranco dot ABC, uh -uh. Okay, well, ICANN is trying to work out how to deal with those issues, but it's doing it inside this walled city, and all it's talking to are corporate interests and lawyers. And to a lesser extent, trademark. Oh, well, trade, yeah, but, but those are corporate interests and lawyers. Yeah. Right. So they're, they're trademark issues. So it just blows open a whole bunch of areas that weren't on the table. You know, we didn't have to have the zoning regulations we have now when, when most people lived in the countryside because the cities were small. Now the cities are huge. Now you mentioned about the public's ability to do its own, to, to basically find its own direction. 
do you see that the possibility may actually happen within, for instance, a group like ICANN, where if they totally foul up the regime of top-level domains, that the world may just say, there's another way of getting in information. We'll use search engines, we'll use QR codes, we'll use other things. That this kind of resiliency that you've been sort of talking about, that you know, no matter what yeah. the governments try and do, the public will find a way to deal with it. Can that resiliency extend even to something as, as, as fundamental as domain names? Yeah, I think it can. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, the, the beauty of domain names and the beauty of the IP uh, addressing strategy was A, it was simple, and B, it covered a whole lot of situations. Uh, the original IP you know, numbers would say, this number is where I am and that number is where I'm trying to get. Get me there somehow and get it back to me. Now with internet uh, IP version 6, uh, we've got a zillion of those numbers. So everything can, can, can have an, an identifiable address that it can be found. Uh, well, there's a whole lot of of uh, latitude within that to come up with some, some new ways of getting from point A to B and finding A, finding B, and B, finding A. Uh, whether it's GPS related or something else, we don't know. But uh, it would be naive to say there is no next step. Well, I'm thinking, for instance, in the case of WikiLeaks, where a number of governments tried to say, no, you can't use .com, no, you can't use this, then you can't use that. The world still finds its way yeah. to WikiLeaks, even despite all these oh, steps yeah. to close yeah. that path down. Yeah, but that, that, that's workarounds. That's finding holes in the wall. Uh, but but this, this electronic space, as it's organized, came out of the, IP, the, the digital revolution, turning everything to zeros and ones. Uh, and... Uh, and then IP addressing, and then making it easier by having the World Wide Web so that you didn't have to be a techie to figure out how to do it. Um, is, is, there, is this chapter one, or is this the last chapter? Is this chapter one? What advice would you give to ICANN right now in terms of shoring up its legitimacy and its ability to do what it wants? I think two things. First of all, recognizing that there are some issues in some of those global top level domains where they have to understand what the issues are, really understand them, and then open the dialogue with all and sundry about how to deal with these issues. ICANN's not going to figure out how to deal with them on their own. And once they're dealt with, ICANN may be only one of the players at the table dealing with it. How does it sufficiently attract all the players. Until now it's been really good at attracting the vested interests, the, the people interest. that make money yeah. out of buying and selling domains. Yeah. They've made uh, an attempt through things like the at-large community to try and have some kind some of a public people, voice, yeah. but it's not really... It's a very limited one, and it's, it's, not, it's neither representative nor accountable. It's just well-meaning people, or people who like you know, go to conferences. So I assume they're mainly well-meaning, but occasionally I run into somebody who's just got all the badges down here, they've gone to every one of them, they're going to keep going, even though they've never contributed much. But I think that uh, it's how they facilitate and collaborate with getting these discussions out there in a bigger way. For dot .health, the area that I know, they have never engaged in a dialogue with any level of the health community other than the contenders for dot health. Right. Even the you know the appeal process, these internal processes, I, I always forget the names of basically boil down to whether or not the name itself was offensive. In December they said, not surprisingly, dot health is not offensive. That's not the issue. Right. The issue is once you plant this flag in the ground, what does it mean? And what rights, you know, I mean, it's best if you go look at the debate or the discussions for dot halal and dot uh, kosher, they're very clear. They're going, why should a private company charge me to evaluate whether I'm a kosher store uh, before it'll give me a dot kosher address? And, you know, what are its credentials? What right does this have other than the fact that you let it have dot kosher? identical put concerns on, on halal. But 
In that sense, though, isn't health like just a word? If somebody wanted to create a .med or something like that, that supplanted all of these in terms of public interest, in terms of doing the right thing, then health is just a word and it can only be yeah. in the realm of whoever wants it, but it won't be the ultimate destination, right? That Nobody be. goes to books.com, they'll go to Amazon or they'll go to chapters or they'll right. go to something. Yeah. And, and the generic word itself doesn't necessarily attract everyone. I think you're, I, I agree with you on that in the long run. In the short run, I think that uh, it's in ICANN's interest, it's in the stakeholders' interest to actually take these, these short-term hot-button issues and treat them as a, as a fo focal point for dialogue. Let's think this through. Let's see, what are the issues here? Uh, and the, the results will be a broader understanding of how we should think about any global top-level domain. Uh, and a better understanding of the ones that end up being proprietary, like .kinder or .abc, um, and, and the ones that are, you know, are more open, like .org or .net. Yeah. Now, if you go to ICANN right now and mention these kinds of things, the typical answer is right now, well, we've already gone so far down this path. We're already starting to delegate some of these names. We have the contracts in place. We have the policies in place. Anything we do right now to try and assert any kind of new interest into this that could roll any of this back mm -hmm. is going to get us sued, is going to cause turmoil. Uh, yeah. How do you answer that? I would uh, to be perfectly frank, I would say to them, will, will you tell me your release dates for dot kosher and dot halal? 